Yo, yo, what's going on, everybody? Hope you're having a good week so far. Before we get into the podcast, uh, just to let you know, if you haven't heard my latest record, My Church, is out now. You can grab it on Beatport, Spotify, Apple Music, all of your local download and streaming platforms. The record is with myself and MK, so it's a big one. Hope you enjoy it. Coming up on today's show is a guest that I'm really excited to kind of introduce you guys to if you do or don't know him. Uh, James Haskell, ex-England rugby player, now currently in the DJ world, getting into music production. He's just just an amazing guy. Uh, had a great conversation with him. Uh, without further ado, James Haskell. James Haskell, how's it going, sir? Very good, mate. Very good. What a pleasure to be in such great musical production and DJ and company. Likewise, man. It's um, it's this this is a kind of really exciting one for me because I don't obviously we never spoke before apart from like two minutes beforehand. But I'm a huge rugby fan. Rugby was like the was literally a huge part of my life growing up, and obviously music kind of took over. And rugby was a huge part of your life, and now music is kind of transfer in, in into a huge part of your life now so thank you for coming on it's an absolute pleasure to have you um i was actually at the gym this morning sweating my ass off on the step machine to see your beautiful face on good morning this britain or whatever that whatever yeah, the was, show yeah. is how was that was. you're good well firstly you know you're a fan of rugby i'm a fan of techno beards <laughs> and cows so okay. basically yeah I think for people who follow you on, on, on social media will know that's pretty much your life uh, 24 hours a day. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm really excited. I didn't, you know, what, when I first, um, I can't remember why it was. I'll tell you why it was. A, f- a friend of mine called Carly Wilford, who, who DJs, yeah, sent, me, uh, yeah, sent me a couple of, um, of your tracks. Right, and I remember putting them on. I was like, "Oh my god, who is this producer? Like, they are unbelievable." So then I followed on. Then I, I I was on Spotify, and I started following on Spotify, and I started listening to music, and I found I found loads of other ones you've done. So you know, like when you go in like a rabbit hole, you start yeah. like, looking around and around and around. And then um, and then you basically and then I started following you on Instagram, and uh, I, when I did my radio show, Back Row Radio, I think I put in like um, Hallelujah and a couple of other ones that you've done. And they're just absolute fucking bangers. And Jeez, I was like, this man. is unbelievable. And then obviously like in, you know, in the bizarre sort of world we live in, you turned out to happen to like rugby. Uh, and we came up with a bit of a, you know, albeit for a social media kind of bit of relationship. But I didn't realise also how big time you were. Like when I see you like talking to people and posting the music you produce and who you've worked with and who you remixed, I'm like, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, all clouds not messing around. See, it's so weird, isn't it, that you think that? Because I don't think that at all about myself. I still think I'm like at the bottom of the bottom. And I don't know if you ever, in like your career in rugby, if you ever kind of had that where you're like, you're playing for England. You're literally playing at the top of pretty much any game that you could get to in in your career Did, were you ever like i can fucking be better i need to be better i need to do this Mate, like, that's that's my whole life yeah. my, my, you know and, and the thing is it's, it's like my recipe for success or so everybody has driving factors on why they want to be successful and what motivates them yeah. so you know mine was early early on was lack of self-confidence in myself around my rugby abilities so wanting to prove my people wrong uh wanting to make my parents proud you go and do that but because it's what drives you on when you do achieve good moments you're constantly looking over your shoulder for the next moment and the next moment and you want to you know nothing satisfactory so even if you get a great win you might focus on um a couple of the negatives in the game yeah and it's great because it, str- it drives you on but it means you don't ever appreciate stuff in the moment and one of my biggest regrets about my career was that i didn't sit back and focus enough i'll take those moments so you know like you releasing your new track church with like mk that's fucking mega. Like it's an absolute, it's, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing track. And I think, you know, you've got to sort of appreciate those moments just as, you know, my book's out, like, you know, that's why you saw me on, on, on Good Morning Britain, you know, it's, uh, I'm not sure when this podcast going out, but it's a Times bestseller. Yeah. And it's, I'm like thinking, I want book two. I'm, you know, I want to do this, this next thing. You know, I've got a track signed. I can't announce where it is yet, but I've, I made a track with a mate of mine. I would just work on track two. And that's been, that's been signed. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. But I want more. What's I next? want more. You know, I, I, yeah, and, I, and, it, and it's it's good. But you have to see it. Once you see the recipe section, you also have to see 
uh, that it can be your undoing if you don't address it. So even yeah. if you regard yourself as like staying humble, some point you got to look at look at some of the stuff you do. Like I remember watching some of your Instagram videos, like the, the size of the crowds you're playing to in some of the the venues, and also the techno world. From what I can see, is like I'm not cool <laughs> enough to ever play techno. Right? <laughs> I, 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 I'm not like there's like a, there's a, like it's like a an elite body of really cool kind of edgy people that just wouldn't let me in with my fucking massive Under Armour trainers and my big head and, and, and everything else. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't work. And I think you see the crowds you're playing with and, and too. It's like, you've got to pat yourself on the back, I think. See, I think that's the thing though, is that you, you, you say all these things and thank you, by the way, um, but you, you say these things, yeah, the record came out with MK a week ago. It's Friday today. This podcast, podcast goes out on Tuesday, but um, I have literally been like, not depressed, but like, in a shit mood for the whole week because the record hasn't done as well as I want it to do and I want it to do better and I and I'm like fuck it it's it's done if you know what I mean and I think that's the thing it's like and and the what you say about being cool enough I say that to myself every day is like I'm not cool enough to be at the top with the with the super cool guys if you know what I mean but I think that is the thing is like even even if I was Kyle Cox, even if you were Kyle Cox, you'd still fucking want more. And you'd still want to, there'd still be somebody like, you'll, you'll be Kyle Cox and you'll be like, oh, I want to be Elon Musk. Like, I, and I think that's the thing. It's just that, but is that what makes, like for you in your, in your career, is that what makes you good? Oh. Sorry, mate. I lost you there for a second. Where did you get up to? Yeah, my internet's playing up big time. Um, like uh, um, what I was saying was, is that what is that where it gets you to to be the best in your career? Yeah, I mean, I think. Look, firstly, um, I think your track's great, and you, you're always gonna be pissed off when you don't you don't have as, as much success you want. But do remember that that people are sitting at home, and you have to be in a certain mindset to listen to techno. Yeah, like and listen oh, totally. to. A, yeah. You know, that's the thing is I was talking to, I've been lucky enough to be, to become quite friendly with Nick Fanciulli and I was talking to him about music and he was like, he goes, the tech house, techno, you know, unless you're really into it and your mindset, people aren't just going to listen to it at home, you know, no. classic house, you know, uh, very vocally house, all these kind of things are what are going to be popular. Totally. And actually releasing stuff at the moment is, is very difficult. Uh, and unless it is kind of like a Joel Corey, you know, style, very, very commercial yeah. thing that you're going to, you know, it's just, it's, it's going to take a bit of heat. And also, you're not getting to road test it in, in, in the clubs. You're not getting to put it out there so people see it, start shazamming it, and it builds up. So, mate, you know, what it, it's one of those things, it, it, it'll be one of those late bloomers where, uh, you know, when we get back to, well, I mean, unless you're going to retrain as a dentist like R Rishi Sunak <laughs> fucking tells you. What a do. cunt. Uh, what a cunt. What an idiot. <laughs> uh, as well. I mean, listen, I understand the economy's fucked. I understand that. I understand, you know, yeah. we've we got to protect stuff. But as an aside... There's 24 other things that ahead of COVID are killing people in the UK at the moment. So you get like two COVID deaths. There's 70 from fucking, you know, uh, pancreatic cancer, all these other things that are killing people. And, you know, when we, when we, when the roads get really icy and we, and deaths on the roads go up, we don't all hide inside with no. our cars. Yeah, and the whole yeah. idea was to protect the NHS and it, and it looks like it's fine, but you don't tell people, you know, to fucking go and retrain. I mean, that's that's just a PR disaster. Like, what was he thinking? Like, you know, he, 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 that was a stupid thing and he's just upset so many people because what is the world without music, art, plays, performances? What is life without yeah. any of that literature? But what the fuck is it? We just, well, I'll tell you what it is. It's all of us sitting at home having shit Zoom calls with people. You know, not like this Zoom call, but you know what I mean? Like when you've got like seven friends on it, you can't get a fucking word yeah. in edgeways. Yeah. You're just watching Netflix on repeat. That's, that's it's shit. Without, without the answer. I think, I think I totally agree with you, but I also have a different view on what he said. Um, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this when you were younger, kind of doing, going through the rugby stage and maybe kind of in after rugby going into MMA, going into music, et cetera, et cetera. But the amount of times I got told by people, you should get a fucking real job. Like my music teacher at school told me that electronic music is not a career. Like, Fuck yourself, dude. Mr. Taylor, you're a wanker. Like Mr. I'm... Taylor. <laughs> Fuck you, Mr. Yeah. Taylor. Um and I and I kind of I kind of wish people kind of took that that as like even more of like a boot up the arse to go, come on, let's just 
heads down and let's make this work because I, I don't think there's there's so many people that don't understand our industry. I, I don't, there's so many arts industries I don't understand. And I understand my our industry to a certain extent. And I just know that there's going to always be those people kind of talking shit on us. There's always people, always councils trying to close down clubs because they want to build houses. There's always somebody kind of pushing against, yet they don't realize, realize how much culture we build. Like classic example, like Motion in Bristol, it was used to be a skate park. Now it's a club. Now it's like a fashionable area. People want to start building houses. Then they want to close the club down. That's that's how every area goes. Um, look at Soho in London. Soho was like used to be a dive. It was the gay area. Like it was pretty pretty grimy. Now look at it. Now it's like shortage. Exactly the same. And I, mean, you, I mean, I'm walking around there trying to buy a poor mag. Just can't get one <laughs> anymore. Do you know what I mean? I can get I can get some reasonable you know reasonable uh, new build housing um you know uh, a lobster salad but i can't get a poem mate, for love nor money yeah and you can't go for a 24-hour massage or anything like that <laughs> mate, how, how's someone supposed to live if you can't operate around there exactly um, but so, I, do, I do get i do get your point as well because i had that when when you know when i was younger and playing they would say people would say um oh yeah so you play rugby i was like yeah so what else do you do what else do you do other yeah. job and i was like no, no I, that's what i do i play full i play full-time rugby and they're like Really? Like, you know, you know, thinking that it, it wasn't real. And I think, you know, it's the same way. It's interesting, actually, because I used to bollock the um, young players at uh, my clubs I was at for just doing nothing apart from sitting around playing video games. Yeah. And I remember going, lads, you know, I've got a few businesses off the field. We're doing all this stuff. You know, you sit around playing video games. You're wasting your life away, right? You're never going to get paid. And it was only about a couple of years ago when someone went, actually, fuck, <laughs> actually, has. Yes, we do. We're getting paid on Twitch. And I was like... Oh my god! People actually get paid to play fucking video games yeah. now. So, I think there's any career is where you get is where you get paid. Um, and I think the music thing, you know, it, it is it is weird because especially house music and stuff. Because it's even though you know things like Defected and all these kind of people have sort of now straddled and brought much more stuff to the, the mainstream. And you get all these events, you get hundreds of thousands of people turn to events. Yeah. Still, for a lot of people, they just don't appreciate it. You know, they they, they don't they don't. Uh, they don't see it, and I don't think they realise how much money, how much entertainment, how much, how many people um, go to festivals, events. You know, um, you, you, see, you saw with the defected live streams, and how many people tuned in every day to enjoy good music. Um, and I think, yeah, I, th- I do, I do take, I do take exactly what you're saying on board. Actually, I think you're probably not far off. That I think it's probably just a lack of respect for say the electric uh, yeah. electronic music industry but then you look at you know someone like Tiesto and Calvin Harris obviously on the other end of the spectrum making 70 to 80 million quid a year it's like that <laughs> don't tell me they're not making money do you know what I mean yeah there's there's definitely and I think it's just as artists you have to adapt you have to adapt to whatever situation you're kind of in and I'm not saying that everyone needs to go and write number one hits but like you can make money out of Spotify you can you can you can make a living out of streaming nowadays um so write music that's still in your genre that just is better so it streams more. It's kind of it's, it's easier said than done, but But the, I think it focuses the mind. I yeah. think this whole this whole this whole process is is you know, I, I talked about it this morning on 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 um when it, you know obviously this is going out so it's a different day, but I was talking about uh the three things in life you can control, right? And the first one is is um how you treat your body. So yeah. you know, there's no definitive way you should look yeah. so you know when people say they're overweight they're, I'm, I'm you know i'm really happy or people are too thin i'm happy look there's obviously healthier ends of the spectrum and all these things but what you look like is irrelevant but it's just how you treat your body because once you know the baz Luhrmann song famously once your knees go you know you're going to miss them because they, yeah, yeah. they're gone you won't grow you don't grow them back yeah. um the second one i think is your mind which is important in this, this lockdown period and people you know I felt like, oh, there's too much pressure on me to perform and upskill myself. But actually, no, I think it's a chance for you to go back and refine and find out what you do and do you actually love it? Yeah. Because the reason I gravitated towards music was I always use music as a tool um, for motivation pre-game. Yeah. So it was all about changing emotional state. So pre-game, you know, you turn up to a, you slept a shit hotel, you had a row with your wife, you haven't been playing that well, pressure in the media. You then put a chosen playlist, which is all got emotive songs. You put them on, 
we start feeling good. We've all had that thing, windows down, you know, listen, listen to one of your tracks like that, you know, you're like fist bump, go, fuck, you know, you pull that face, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. right? Um, you know, and that's how you do it. And then I, I, then I started going to Ibiza and Vegas and, I, you know, I'd see this guy or woman at the front of the ho- whole place controlling everybody's mood, everybody's uh, uh, emotion. You know, if they played a wrong song, it could take the emotion out of the room. Yeah. If they played banger after banger, people's hands in the air, beautiful people, sun shining. I was like, and they've got all the attention. I was like, I'm an attention seeker. Yeah. I fucking love music. <laughs> and, I, I, and I wanted to learn a skill and I was fascinated by it. And it's become for me something I genuinely love doing. And I think that if, if you don't love what you do, this lockdown will have shown you what that, you know, that if you don't enjoy your job, yeah. if you're not satisfied, if you've got nothing about you apart from work and your family, you've got no hobbies, you've got no interest, you've got no thing to turn the pressure on. Because if you're, when I was playing, I had rugby, I had my fitness business, I, had, I did afternoon, afternoon speaking and like corporate speaking, I DJ'd and I did um, like social media stuff and I had my rugby and obviously I had my missus. So if rugby was going shit, my missus was going shit, but I was getting a lot of fun from DJ and speaking and writing. I always shared the burden. So I had something yeah. to look forward to. That's cool. And I think, I think it's quite nice in this period of time for people to like yourself, to go back and refine your art, to go back and actually go, do you know what? I actually love doing what I'm doing and there's no pressure on me because, um, you know, we're, we're locked up and, and develop it and create some great tracks. It was like, I was talking to Nick and he said, you know, he, he'd been on the road for, for however many years and he liked producing, but you know, he obviously Grammy nominated and he, done bits and pieces but hadn't really done it recently and was like actually i love being back in the studio now and it all sort of coming back to him and him working you know i think he's got a couple of collaborations with mk himself and a few few yeah. little things going on that it, it's and it, and it and it really shows you know i mean i i called my mate up and I, who was um who's far better on ableton than me but i know you know i did a tool room course so i you know about 12 weeks so i know yeah. what i'm looking at so we just sat down and put together a track. We got it, you know, we got it signed and we're just working on another one. Um, and I just really enjoyed it. And then, you know, if, cause I'm not doing the MMA stuff because of lockdown at the moment or because of the, 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 the lockdown and some injury, it meant that if I'd rely on just that, I would have felt shit, but the music thing's going quite well. And I've got a book out. So it's kind of nice balance, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I think I, for me, I'm still working out that balance because my whole life is like, my whole life is music. And even when I'm touring, so my, my kind of daily routine is wake up, go to the gym, um, go to the studio. And then in the evening, might catch up with some mates or cook some food. That is literally my, even when I'm touring, I'm still doing that. And I think since coming home, like I, that touring stopped and it's been so nice to like spend time with family and friends, but I'm still like, Hmm. I'm still just doing the same thing. And as much as I love it, I'm like, I need to do something different, but I also need to learn how to relax. And uh, that's the thing for me. I don't know. I don't know if how you, I don't know during like now or where in your life, have you ever learned to relax, but like, it's fucking hard. I can't relax. Yeah. I can't relax. And it's, and it's a real problem. You know, it means that I will sit and work till, you know, 11, 12 o'clock at night. You know, I take my laptop into the other room. We're sitting there watching a movie. I'd be on my phone. Um, and because, you know, when I was, say, for example, for lockdown, a normal week was, say, Monday, Monday, go and speak at Investec. Tuesday, drive, go to Gloucester and speak at a Rotary dinner. Wednesday, film for, like, MasterCard. Thursday would be, like, a, a day off, but, like, I'd have training. Friday, fly to Belgium. DJ Friday night. Back Saturday. And you just went round again. Yeah. And then everything was always very different and, and people find it quite hard. I think if you're a workaholic, they, 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 or they see me as a workaholic, they find it quite hard to reconcile. How can you do this? You know, because one day your mind's on music. So preparing a DJ set, then you've got to write a speech because it's not regurgitated stuff. It's not specific to that company. Yeah. And then it's a lighter hearted speech. And then it's suddenly going to master guard and talking about other stuff. It, it, it's a very kind of weird, weird thing. So what I've realized is, is at putting, putting the media down to putting the laptop down, putting the phone down, putting a cut off in your, in your, yeah. in your diary and going, right at seven o'clock, come what may, I'm not going to put, put anything, you know, I'm not going to do anything, you know? And then things like at meal times, if my wife's not here, I will put breakfast, nice coffee, nice food. And I'll just put on Netflix. Won't pick up my phone. Won't try and eat and work at the same time. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting what you're saying about your, yourself with that. It's just, if you find something else, that can nestle into that thing apart from 
combing the beard and oiling it up. <laughs> if you if you can find something else that will sit alongside that, do you know what? It will probably make you a better producer and it will yeah. probably make yeah. you better focus because you will have balance. So when I was playing, people criticised me, say you're doing too much, you're not focused on the task in hand. But if I knew that when I, went, when I turned up at 7.30 in the morning and I left at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, everything about that point was about what I was doing. So I wasn't trying to... Um, answer emails, speak to people. It was just about rugby. And it was like, you know, and I split my day up into areas of self-improvement. So it would be simple as diet, speed, handling, recovery, stretch it, you know, all these things. Yeah. And if I did, if I did each one of them for the allotted time, I was, you know, that was like 1% each. I was 10% better than I was the day before. Yeah. And then when that day finished, I would then come home and focus on my next job and next task. And that gave me more balance. So it meant that I was actually more focused on my task. If you know you've got the same routines you train, which is great, because that's great for mental health, great for being routine, getting up. Then you eat, then you go and sit in the studio. I find sometimes when you go to sit down, if I think about DJing and putting a set together in record box or what I'm going to do, if you start going on your emails and then your WhatsApps, you've got to go and define a box and go, this next hour is DJ only. Yeah, Go and do that. When that's finished, that next hour is is uh, email because of, there's so many ways for people to get hold of you. It's it's, like, it's kind of, you have to box it up. Yeah, yeah, it's, I totally agree. If, I think it's about focus, isn't it? Um, it's if if you can can dedicate your whole time to one thing, you know you're going to be the best, uh, the best you possibly can do at that. And I think when you're I can only speak for myself, but when I'm in the studio writing and my phone's going off and I'm doing emails and then my manager calls me and then my mum walks in from across the street or something like that, it's like you're not focused and I'm not writing the best music. When when my phone is away and when emails are off and when I'm just like pissing about, that's when the best ideas come out. Um, but... I, my internet keeps on popping in and out. It's so annoying. Um, but when when it comes to let's let's go back to rugby a little bit. Um, and how how much work did it did it take? Because let's say for, for instance with music, I think a lot of people just see. I speak about this quite a lot on the podcast, but um, people just see the glory. If you know what I mean, people just see we we only show people the glory. Um, we don't show the hours and hours of just being in the studio by yourself or what, working out how to make one sound or working on vocals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How hard is it to get to that level in in rugby? If if that makes sense. Look, I, I think it's. You know, they talk about 10,000 hours, don't they? You become proficient after doing 10,000 hours of yeah. of anything. <laughs> to be honest with you, my approach to life was it is one of one that you only get one opportunity. So, I, you know, apologize to any listeners who are super religious who think they're going to come back as like a penguin or there's like <laughs> more to this. I don't think there is. I think this is all you get and, and that, you know, um, once we're done, we're done. And so you've got to maximize everything you've got. So if you pursue music or rugby you know for me it was about leaving no stone unturned in the pursuit of being the best I could be and it when it was as simple as from, I've talked about it in my book what a flank but I born out of some failure early on you know taught me that if I hadn't put the work in I wasn't going to have the success so it showed me that if I worked and I was committed I would get success and that's a very early lesson for someone to learn around 15 14 15 yeah because uh, most people find that later on in life so I was quite lucky with that um, and it fitted with my personality combination again of that lack of self-confidence wanting to prove people wrong it's kind of a nice recipe as I said the recipe for success but my my entire career was all about the extra work so you know you would you know spend you know I mean you the, the, my normal week would be play Saturday Sunday off in Monday in Tuesday Wednesday off uh, in Thursday in Friday play Saturday go around and but in, and then you would be, you know, in 7.30, you know, most of the time out the door, I don't know, 3.30, 4 o'clock, maybe, maybe slightly later. But then I would go and see, you know, the best physio I could find. Even, yeah. even though the club provided physios, I was like, listen, I'm not prepared to 
take everything that's on offer. You know, I think you can find better. So I went and found better. Um, you know, I went and found a better nutritionist. I went and found better strength coaches. I went and found speed coaches. I went and found players that I could look up to and admire. And I reached out for help and I was constantly on this journey and mental health was a huge focus for me. You know, if I, if I, it's interesting as well, because I think, um, I haven't used it for DJing stuff because I, you know, probably the most nervous I get is before I go on and DJ. I don't yeah. get nervous about anything, uh, anything else really because it's it's something I'm still learning. You know, there's there's perception that I'm going to be shit house, yeah. so you know people are looking for you to fail. So, of course, yeah. Um, yeah. so I basically I was re- I reached out from the age of kind of 17 to 35 to a to a sports psychologist psychologist and and started off with things as simple as, um, you know using music as a tool, getting consistent performance, dealing with failure, dealing with upset. You know, for example, like you said about your track, like, you know, um, being in a bad mood about it. You know, yeah. I, I, the other day, I was trying to put this fucking tour and mix together, right? They asked me to do, and I was, de- I was de- and I was DJing, I was DJing, and, you know, I'd make a mistake, like I'd, you know, with a V10, Pioneer V10, you've got so many little things on. I left an echo on yeah. for like two, for, for two beats after the fucking end. And it, you know, and I sent it to my DJ teacher. I was like, what do you think? He's like, did you leave the echo on there? I was like, fuck, I didn't think you, <laughs> like, I didn't think it was that prominent. So then you go back and do it again because you're nervous. So it would be something I would go and speak to them about. And they would, and, and, you know, I remember saying about mistakes in games or, or mis- making mistakes and being worried about making mistakes. And, and she turned around and said, very much like what your, your analogy with your track making is when an artist paints a picture, all you see is the final picture. Yeah. All you see is that, right? What you don't see is the thousands of scrumpled up pieces of paper sitting by the fucking bin where they've written it, scrumpled up and lobbed yeah, it away. Totally. And, um, you know, rugby, rugby in sport is very much like so the mental side was so important to, to harness. So mate, it was an all encompassing thing. It, it was, it was, you know, they talk about nine to five jobs, but it was actually the five to nine. It was yeah. what you did outside of that area and how you applied yourself, even the decisions not to go on the piss with your mates, not, you know, you, you know, not to go and eat bad food or, or whatever. And it's, it was a constant struggle because I missed out on university. I missed out on lots of things and I didn't go traveling. Um, that's perhaps why I act like a giant child now, you know, I'm 35 and I'm sort of catching up on all the things now I'm retired <laughs> that I didn't get to, I didn't get to do, you know, so I'm fully, I'm fully into raving. Everyone else get out of raving. I'm like, let's go raving. <laughs> like, oh, we've got, we've got kids now. We've got like, kids. Yeah. Off. Who cares? All of, all of my mates are having kids right now and getting married and I'm like, can't do it, lads. Sorry. Can't do it, lads. Sorry. Yeah. Not, no. not yet. Anyway, there's, there's too many groupies. You know, you've got to show the beard off. Like, you know what I mean? It's just there's too much, too much admin. When when the world goes back to normal, and it will, because there's no way we're going to keep up with this stupidity for a long time. Because just like we don't lock each lock each other away and stop eating bad food and stop smoking for cancer, we ain't going to carry on doing stuff for the least. But you know, we just got to you know manage this weird, bizarre storm for a bit. Yeah, this time next year we will hopefully be back to normal and kind of back in the clubs and back doing what what we want to do. Um, so a book, what obviously your book, what the flank has just come out. Um, why, why did you want to start? Why did you want to re- write one? So I, I so I've, this is actually my fourth book. Uh, I've got more books than I didn't know that. Why did I not know this? Four is not, not <laughs> uh, Um, it's, it's basically, I, so I started a podcast a while ago that I can't, I'm not going to talk about the original name, but it's now called The Good, The Bad, The Rugby. And we basically got about 16 million downloads and it had been running for two seasons. I think like it's a hundred shows and it was like 60 or 17 million downloads. That's amazing. Reached. And, um, you know, I, I was sort of always a bit tentative about writing autobiography because I wasn't sure that people would be interested. I wasn't sure that I maybe had the gravitas or the, the, you know, the tactical insights of the people interested in. But then I realized that most autobiographies now, especially from sports people, very sanitized, can't say anything because they're worried about getting sued. Um, a lot of people do it while they're still playing. Yeah. I wanted to create something that was short book of short stories, which was fun, but was was able to show what the journey I had from living in Paris, New Zealand, Japan, England, playing 77 times for England, going to On the Lions, all the scandals, being a front page of newspapers, the mad off-field activities, you know, I, and also throughout my career, I'd always had to hold my tongue. I'd always had to um, not say, you know, um, you know, what I really thought about things because yeah. you can't, you want to keep playing life's politics. Life's all about politics. You know, we all know that one, that one friend or one person that is, you know, is great for speaking up and they're always like <laughs> telling everyone how they really think. 
but they don't get anywhere because no. nobody wants that. Unless, yeah. you know, unless you're like Rosa Parks, who who stopped, you know, who obviously stopped, you know, stuff on se- segregation and white, and white buses, on, uh, um, you know, letting people, black people onto the bus, et cetera, not moving, which was like definitive. Yeah. For every Rosa Parks, there's a load of people who tried to do that and just got absolutely battered. Yeah. Um, totally. And I think it's important to do that in the world, but it's also to realize, you know, some battles you ain't going to win. And um, this book was a nice opportunity to recount some of the some of the truth and some of the stories that perhaps I had, had never told. No, I listen. I'm not a huge fan of reading, but I listened to it in about a day and a half, um, and it was fucking great. And I didn't realize how much you travelled in your like rugby career because, I, I, as much as I love rugby, I pretty much only follow like England. I'm not a huge yeah. team team person, if you know what I mean. I, Bristol was my closest team, and they they were good back in the day, and then they got relegated and got really shit, and then I don't know, and I just like just kind of fell now, out. Oh, but now, mate, now Bristol are mega. Are they good? I haven't followed mate, it in Bristol, ages, mate. Bristol are unbelievable. Bristol are about are, are playing for a, a Premiership final spot. They've signed all these superstars. They've got a whole new set of branding. They're like the new stadium, mate. It's They're Bristol like Bear. It's Bristol Bear. Is it Bristol Bears now? Yeah, which is quite funny because obviously the gay community, uh, they bear must is, love is, it. Is something you know, and there was there was a team, I think, an all inclusive team or something in Bristol called the Bristol Bears. And uh, you know, but I love it, man. I think the branding's brilliant, and I, and I think they're fantastic. And their social media, you should follow Bristol Bears because out of all the social media for all the clubs, they do the best. They're the best. They're like zero fucks given. Just say whatever they want. It's wicked. I might need to follow them. But yeah, I, I didn't realize like how far you traveled for rugby. And I think it's something that as DJs, we're super lucky that we get to go to like all corners of the world. But most athletes don't really, apart from if it's like a competition, but not, not many people athletes get to like go and live in Japan or go and live in New Zealand or Australia or Paris and things like that. What, what's it like tra- traveling about playing playing rugby when you're kind of you're from the book i was like you're going into these places where you can't even speak the language but but the lang the the language for you is rugby um yeah but how does that work um look it was pretty it was pretty special that that opportunity because i think you know having done a minor bit of traveling with the djing stuff you know and similar to when you got went on uh away games of rugby and if you played over you'd more often not see a hotel a training field yeah and again, exactly. you wouldn't yeah. actually get to experience it. Saying so, you know, a DJ gig, you sort of turn up, hotel, probably got to, you know, maybe just tweak the set, go out, sleep, you know, wake up, and then you're off, or you're yeah. off again. Um, so the, the thing that with the, the rugby going over there was was you know, the first time I moved to Paris uh, from WAS was about me getting to play with some of the best players in the world. Was you know uh, getting good money and and you know and going to just explore something you know to to go against the odds and see what it was like. And I went over there and I lived with a guy called Ollie Phillips who was um, who was brilliant. Um, and he him and I sort of lived in the heart of Paris. And every day you're driving past you know the Arc de Triomphe, the the you know just next to Champs Elysees, the Eiffel yeah. Tower, going all these parts of France and everything sort of new and exciting. Um, but you know all the European languages are based on Latin. So you can sort of, you know, pick up bits and pieces of what's going on, you know? Yeah. But when you go, when you go to Japan and live there and, and, you know, there's no, you can't work out what anyone's saying. It was, it was exciting, but you're right. You know, I was there to do a job. So you were anchored with the fact that you were there to a job, that you understood what your job was. Uh, You had foreign, foreign teammates in all those teams who could speak English. Okay. Which made life a little bit easier. But in Japan, for example, we used to have translators, so the translators would sit on the side of the training field, right? And what they would do is sit on the side of the training field and they would, when the head coach came to speak to us, all the foreign forwards would go around one translator and all the foreign backs would go around another translator. And the coach would be like, they do this, do this. The translator would tell you, go off and do it. Um, and on match days, they'd run on the water. So they'd come on and give a message to you and anything else. But the, yeah. f- the funny thing was that when the when the head coach got the, got the hump... <laughs> I was upset and was sort of, you know, they don't really get, they don't get like angry and um, in Japanese, you know, they sort of don't have a word, they don't have a word yeah. for no. So they don't really, they don't, they don't like confrontation. But basically what happens when you ask the Japanese person to do something they don't want to do, they they don't say no. It just doesn't happen. And then you just, you ask why and they're like, ah, oh, you know, and it, it's really weird. Like it's sort of, they don't want to offend anyone, but they just don't do what they, you want them to do. And you kind of, they're so polite. And in, um, with one of these translators, 
and the head coach was getting really upset after his game and was like, and the translator was getting angry, but she was just as angry as, I'm like, fucking hell, love. You could give her like a B at GCSE for drama. And then if the coach started crying because they were partial to the odd tear, the translator started crying. Really? Like, that is commitment. Yeah, it was commitment to roll that. Um, that, that is but also they didn't, they didn't translate back what you were saying either. So I, I remember there's a physio lady who was late Sorry, I was late, right, because I'd been doing my rehab stuff and I couldn't get into this thing. And this physio was, was telling me off. And I said to the translator, listen, I, said, I, I can't, I, I, I'm not late. I was doing something. I can't, you know, tell her that. And, and, and you know, the, the woman would come back. She goes, no, 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 you're, you know, you're late. And I said to her, listen, and I was getting more upset. I was saying, you fucking tell her. <laughs> I was doing my rehab and for my ankle, being a professional, that's why I'm late. And I could see the translator wasn't saying anything I was telling her to say because the the, the little physio was still smiling. And I was like, <laughs> and I said to her, you're not, you're not translating. She went, I am. I said, you're fucking not because she's still smiling. How can she still be smiling when they're telling her to fuck off? Um, so yeah, that was, it was quite funny. That's amazing. How amazing is Japan though? Because I've, I've toured there a couple of times and it's literally my favorite country I ever go to. Mate, it's the greatest country I've ever been to. I think, you know, Tokyo... I was lucky enough to stay there during the World Cup. Yeah. Uh, we were out there for three weeks, two and a half weeks. Mate, what a place. Uh, you know, if you, if you, if you, reckon if you stayed there for three months, you wouldn't see everything. You know, there's more Michelin star restaurants per any square foot than anywhere else in the world. You know, you culturally, it's just fascinating. Um, I think it's so exciting. My wife and I absolutely love it. I mean, I want to uh, 100% want to go back there and just, you know, just do what we did, stay in a, stay in a hotel and every day, go and see something else. It's, it's like, it's just worlds apart from any other like Western country, right? You can go to like pretty much any country in. Are you still there? Yeah, sorry, I lost yeah, you there for a yeah, second. No, I, okay, it was, fucking, I couldn't hear not. what you're saying. Um, I was just saying how how different it is to any like Western country. Like you can go to like like we can we could fly to Sydney tomorrow and it'd be pretty much the same as London, or we could fly to LA. It's pretty similar, right? Whereas you fly to Japan and you're like, shit the bed. What, what's this? Like how everyone just walks in one line and like no one kind of crosses each other. And then you're just like, this is just another world. But everyone's so nice and so respectful. Yeah, I think, look, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's culturally so interesting as well that, you know, the, the you know, like I said, the, the fact they don't say no. Yeah. Um, the, the fact that they... Um, you know, everybody has a job and it's really important yeah. to have a job. And, you know, but even if you're, it's weird sort of things as well. Like if I was a boss of somebody, um, they, my staff wouldn't go home until I went home. Yeah. Because it's that perception of being successful. And there's, there's, there's just literally jobs for the boys everywhere. So even if you're walking on the pavement and there is the t a tiny hairline crack, you get a dude, dude there with blue overalls, a red uh, fluorescent sash and a tiny little luminous lightsaber. And just be waving you past it, and you're like, there is literally no need for that job, but they will, they will find it. And I think, you know, diet wise and food wise is is insane. You know, um, I was lucky enough to go around the fish market a few times and and see and see what it was like. Uh, if you go back to um, go back to touring there, you need to go eat at a place called Andy's. Okay. Uh, Andy's place, it mate, unbelievable. Really? I will I'll give you the details. It's um, sort of based on like a, an, it's like an izakaya they call it, which yeah, is like. Yeah. They've got the lamp, yeah. 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 And, mate, the food is unbelievable. Andy's an absolute hero. He, um, he, you know, he took Chloe and I around the uh, Skidgy, the fish market, yeah. where it's moved, actually. Yeah, it's that he, is Nick, 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 what's it called now? Nick, I, I can't, yeah, I don't yeah, know. I don't I know where it is. But, it. but he, he's the only foreigner or Gaijin allowed to buy fish in that, in that, oh, really? in that place. So, so he'll take you in. So it's like me and Chloe and him and just all Japanese people. There'll be no other Westerner in there and he's been doing it for 20 odd years and um you know people still try and challenge him and throw him out and he's I like no that. but he he um because he owns this restaurant mate it's amazing so he goes and you see him buying the tuna buying the fish buying this buying the eel and mate he the food i just i wish i was there now actually it's absolutely amazing i love japanese food i cook i make like ramen quite a lot ramen's like oh, really favorite. yeah yeah i i i'm i love cooking and uh I've got. See, that's a, your thing. Yeah, that that's is it. That is it. Is the thing. I've got a food page on Instagram, which is quite funny. Have you? Yeah, yeah. I, I love that, I lo mate. So, like, but 
the, I think the thing that I love about Japanese culture is just the detail, the attention to detail. Even in their fashion, their fashion is like, I don't know if fashion actually appeals to you or anything like that in your uh, in your Under Armour trainers or anything like Mate, that. The problem, but... problem with fashion is, you know, I'm <laughs> too big for fashion. <laughs> I'm too big for fashion. Like, you know, that, that's the thing is like fashion st- stops and starts at medium to large. If yeah. you're lucky, size 10 feet. Size 13 and like 22 inch neck and like, you know, a 38 waist. Ain't, ain't, that's not where fashion goes. You know what I mean? Like I, people look at it and go, oh, we'll do a suit for you. And then they get the dimensions. They're like, no, we don't. What are we supposed to do with it? It's like, <laughs> um, but no, but you're, you're right about the, t- the attention to detail stuff. That I think, you know, the precision, the dedication, um, you know, the, just the whole, the whole thing is insane. Yeah. I, I, I've always said that if I, could if i could earn good money in asia i would definitely go and do like a year out there and just just experience it do i like do i like the music over there yeah that it's it's very it's a very niche market um so there's a place called sound museum there's a place called womb Womb Uh, i've heard of yeah womb and then there's i think they're gonna kill me because it's the people that book me um i forgot (laughs) the name of the other club um, but that's in Tokyo and there's a few other places around. Um, but it's, it's very small and it's more so people just go to the club. They're not necessarily go into, well, like I'm not big enough out there for people to come and want to see, like there might be like five people in the crowd that know who I am, but the rest of it is people just come into the club knowing what they're going to get. Um, Fine. but it's, there's something about the culture that I really like. It's very like underground, but it's also very community based. So like all of the promoters, like all of the resident DJs, they're all super nice. Like you go out there, they all take you out. They look after you. Like it's the best kind of hospitality that I've ever experienced in, in any touring. They will get you, they will get you um, steaming and take you to karaoke as well. Yeah. Well, I don't drink. I'm like, tea, I'm teetotal. So they try to, but we just end up eating ramen. So last time I was there, we, we they just feed me. It's literally oh, really? like we go from one restaurant, we ate like horse at one restaurant, and then I've, I've had um horse uh, raw horse yeah, sashimi, horse tartar. Yeah, it's so good. I know, so good. I was like fucking Black Beauty, get him. <laughs> put him in a wood chipper. I'm I'm ready for dinner. My mum and dad have horses, and I sent them a picture, and I was like, here we go. This is this is Bumble or Muffin on the plate. <laughs> I love that. Oh, what oh, typical horses? They Bumble or Muffin, oat, pancake. The worst name. I, they bought yeah. this horse. They bought these two horses, and I was like, what's their names? And I, they were like Bumble and Muffin. I was like, who the fuck? called this horse bumble and muffin it's like, it's like my love it's like my loving as well <laughs> just oh yeah you know like tiesto just one name that's all you need yeah exactly what so growing up um where did you grow up oh, so i bought i was grew up around windsor mate okay. you know born with a silver spoon in and around my say, mouth or ass whichever one the expression yeah is. <laughs> in the ass definitely probably definitely, definitely in the ass. In the I went ass. to boarding school so that was you know that was part i was character building is is rugby like do you have to go to boarding school to be to to become successful in rugby? No, look, I think um, I think look for for a long time, you know, uh, rugby is is seen as an elitist sport, yeah. and to be honest with you, the issue with it is is that actually rugby is, is just not as popular as people think it is. People yeah, inside yeah. rugby think it's the be all and the end all, but it's actually not. A lot of people are like so they support England. It doesn't really filter down to the club side. Yeah. And the thing with it is is that they that you know. <sighs> They don't play rugby in, in state schools, really. They don't play it normally. Football is, is the most accessible, easy thing to do. And, you know, it just, we just don't have access to it. So that's one of the grassroots rugby clubs, local rugby clubs, are so important because that's a merging of everybody. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think there are lots more people who didn't go to public school. But there is always this sort of belief that, you know, if you don't go to public school, your face doesn't fit and you're not right. We're never going to make it. And you know, now Ellis Genge, uh, you know, a former teammate, a really good friend of mine, was saying, you know, he reckons there's three or four blokes on the building site where he used to work that were better than some of the guys yeah. in the current squad, but you know, just didn't get the opportunities to play. I think you can only do with what's in front of you. You can only totally. play with what's in front of you. But I never wanted to be a rugby player. I, I wanted to be in the SAS or driver JCB. Um, 
And I basically just went to a school where my dad used to go to uh, and I did everything in school. So I, I wasn't, you know, oh, yes, I'm a meathead and a jock, but I wasn't, I wasn't sold to that. You know, my A-levels got A and two Bs, history, yeah. politics, English. I, I represent, I did the theatre. I did, you know, football, tennis, hockey, did everything yeah. that I possibly could. Not not very well at it, any of it, but just, <laughs> just cracked on with it. And then the rugby thing was an opportunity that came up that I, that I accepted to do for a year. And I deferred my university entry for a year and, you know, 18 and a half seasons, I was still doing it. And it's yeah. kind of a bit of a, a weird, a weird situation. I don't really know what I would be doing if I wasn't doing that. I think that's an amazing thing, isn't it? Because it's like, you don't have your heart set on one thing, but you just put everything into it to make it work. I think that's, yeah, exactly. that's, that's the thing. And I mean, I, go on. So I'm interested how, how, why you don't drink. Have you never, have you never not drunk? Not really. So I used to drink occasionally when I was like, in your teenagers and then i just never liked it and also i was i was training all the time so i was like playing rugby a lot when i was younger and never i was like i, I you know like when you're at grassroots level so yeah so you're playing grassroots playing school playing this is like year nine so how old are you like 14 year nine yeah you're yeah, playing yeah. so you're playing grassroots you're you're playing school, you're playing first team school, you're playing county and you're playing district all in one week. And then that just kind of keeps going and going and going. And you're like, I can't, aff- like, I, I want to be the best at what I can. And I yeah, I can't yeah. afford to just get pissed with all the lads every, every so weekend. What's in, your, what's in your rider then? What would be your, what's your rider if I was going to put you for a gig? <laughs> so there is alcohol in the rider, but that's always for your mates. Right, fine, Always fine. got to keep. What, like what? I want to know what's your, what's your, what's your, what's your. I don't your, know. You know. A bottle of Dom Perignon, a bottle of Don Julio, nineteen sixty four, couple of waters. Yeah, tequila for my manager. Um, bottle of vodka because that just anyone can just drink that. Yeah, and then yeah. in America, Lacroix. I, we don't get it here, which is is that the one? Is that champagne with the cross on it? No, it's spark. It's just sparkling water, Fla- ah, flavored sparkling right. water. Um, but. and then some Voss water. I'm I'm a posh twat when it comes to water. Fucking yeah, you got to be. I'm I'm a Fiji water man. Actually, yeah. a bit of boss as well. Um, no, because it's interesting because my rider is that uh, it, it varies. So my tour manager, whenever I go and do something, he'll go, "Are you drinking tonight?" And I'll be like, yeah. "No." And it'll always be a bottle of water, two tubs of original Pringles, some Marks and Spencer chicken slices, a Waitrose chicken <laughs> slices, a pasta, a pasta salad, a packet of chewing gum, a couple of Red Bulls, and uh, you know that's it. But then my but then I put with the lads. It's a um, bottle of Don P, bottle of Don Julio, um, and load, a load of uh, a load of mixed and a bottle of red wine or white wine for my missus. Yeah. That's it. But also, apparently, if you go too big with the rider, I mean, obviously, I'm not I'm not at your guys' level, but you know, when they look at it and go, "Fuck me," they're paying you this, and you're doing an extra two grand on the rider. People just won't book you. Well, I think it come like, I, so my manager, he used to be like, he was like one of the biggest agents in America. So he booked, he looked after some like extremely big people. Um, and yeah, he was saying that what pretty much your rider just comes out of your fee. So they yeah. see your rider and your, yeah, it just gets taken out. So it is, you're kind of paying for it. So it just doesn't really make sense at all at any level to have a huge rider. Unless you're like Lady Gaga. I remember I, I worked in I on a show in Ibiza with and Lady Gaga was there and it was I was DJing but I wasn't I wasn't I was working in like production then. And Lady Gaga's rider literally filled up the whole of the green room. It was like fresh sushi, like everything. Like anything you could think of, like was the, was her rider. And it you walked into the green room and there was like two or three green rooms next to each other and one green room was literally just her whole rider. And you're like, okay. But I think it's what's interesting as well, some of them they reckon that they don't even know what they've asked for. They just they you know, yeah. there's a lot of their like management and PR um get on and do that. I mean, I yeah, I uh I just tried to think about the pra- the practical practicalities, but the best one I did was I did um Harper Adams Uni, right? They they do this like uh Thing where they spend a hundred grand on this like end of end of year ball, right? They get like Jaguar skills, they get yeah. and everybody to come down and do it. And I DJ one year, and I, I the bloke was, oh, you got quite a reasonable rider. And I was like, really? And he goes, yeah, we had scouting for girls in here, <laughs> and uh, they all, they asked for a dog, a puppy, and they got and 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 I said, well, what did you do? And they said they got a puppy, and I was like, that's Fuck, dedication. What do you mean? And, and then I said, well, 
what, what else do you have? He goes, well, um, this other band asked for um, a signed photo of Desmond Tutu, right? <laughs> but obviously that's the whole point is based on that Rolling Can't Stones. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. You know, so, you know, uh, but I think I've got, I get signed pictures of Alan Partridge on all of my, all of my riders. And they're and they're everywhere in the they're everywhere in the house. That's my wife amazing. Like, Can we get rid of them? I've got like twenty of them. But one time I turned up to a gig and the fuckers got me the picture of sign, a sign photo of Alan Partridge and nothing else. <laughs> and I was like, no, that's not the point, you dickhead. You're supposed to read the, the whole thing. So, yeah, the whole thing. So you know that basically. I mean, I will tell the listeners. Maybe they don't know, but basically, the Rolling Stones went and did a gig once, and uh, the pyrotechnics weren't set up properly. It almost blew up fucking Mick Jagger or whoever it was. So basically, they used to put on the uh, on their rider something like the brown M&Ms in a, in a brandy glass or whatever it was, because they knew if they turned up to an event and there was brown M&Ms in a brandy glass, it, they knew that they would have read through the rider and everything would be set up because that attention to detail. I turned up, they bought the one thing I didn't want and left everything else out. And I was like, but well, that's the kind of level I'm operating at. I, I have Margot Robbie on my um on my rider so what, so hoping she's gonna get dropped ho- off hoping one. she's gonna get dropped off just just for a night but you get a call though you must get a call because like people book book you going what does he mean what does will mean about margo robbie we can't get do you want a picture of her like what are we gonna yes do? then it's like margo robbie or like a life-size cutout. um oh, and that. so i've got in my studio there's like this see this thing behind here yeah, yeah. That's like a whole movie thing, like yeah. of like the birds and the praise and Margot Robbie. Oh, excellent. I used to have one in the corner, which was like literally like a life size of Margot Robbie. And then yeah. I played in Albuquerque in America. And that, you know, what's, what's her name in when she's in Birds, birds of Prey? Uh, Harley oh, Quinn. Uh, Harley Quinn. Yeah. They had some chick that did does like a Harley Quinn impression and they like hired her. And I was like, yes, this is happening. Oh, that's so good. I, do you know what? Um, I actually I discovered uh, the other day that I went, um, I went to an event and this woman was there and she went, oh, James, how are you? And I was looking at her, who else? She goes, oh, I'm um, somebody actually. I was like, oh God, yeah, I went to, um, I went to school with your, your, um, your boys. How are they? And I went, you're, um, there isn't another brother I don't know. And they went, oh yes, yeah, the third brother. I went, He's married to, she went, yeah, married to Margot Robbie. I was like, oh my God. So actually, I actually knew, knew, the, knew the family and I was thinking, fuck. I mean, my wife won't be, you know, won't be that keen. Uh, but she used to live in Clapham. Did she? So I'm like, yeah, I used to live in Clapham. Used to like, operate around with like just normal, like just an absolute normal lad. And uh, he's, he's, he's lucked out really. So, Mate. You know, but I've lucked out with my beautiful wife as well. Oh, you have to say that, of course. But... Margot yeah, Robbie. I'm not sure she's going to listen to this unless, <laughs> unless you put a clip on social media and be like, James, you're always fucking talking about other women. I'm like, no, babe, I love you. <laughs> Margot Robbie is just Rosie Huntington Whitley as well. Yeah, she was. Yeah, she was. I, I, to be fair, I'd take Margot over. I, wrote, wrote, I loved her in Transformers. Um, oh. You know, <laughs> I love that side. <laughs> there's a man who spends too much time in the studio just thinking about, you know, like Megan. Do you remember Megan Fox? Before yeah. All the work there? in Transformers. Rainbow. Megan, yeah. Megan Fox, and all, all the Transformers is just like, yeah. damn. Yeah. Even Mark Wahlberg looked fire in one of them. Mate, I still would. Put it that <laughs> no, way. Of course you would. <laughs> I would as well. What, Ryan I mean, Gosling. You'd have, have, have to turn down the evangelical thing a bit about it. But yeah. to be fair, if he was sleeping with me, then he knows he's going to hell, so it'd be fine. Exactly. Ryan Gosling, he's, he's also on the list. Mate, on Gangster Squad. I watched Gangster Squad yesterday. I, yeah, Ryan I watched Gosling. that the other day. Yeah. Hey, he's such a dreamboat. I was like, oh my god. There's there's a club in San San Diego called Bang Bang, and in the toilets, there's literally like just pictures of Ryan Gosling, and you're just like, this dude is so good, so good looking. Whilst whilst you're taking a piss, and Ryan Gosling's just staring at you, you're like. Oh. I love that. Probably not gone out right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a bit weird trying to pee with an erection. Yeah, Why exactly. <laughs> Um, let's, let's talk about this. Women in rugby. Yeah. <laughs> that was the most loaded sentence in the history of the universe. It right? was, yeah. it was, but there's, there's two things. Obviously, are there many women rugby fans? Yeah. Do you know what? It, it's a, like a really growing, um, a growing market really. I think, um, What's happened is as well, now that the women, so 
you know, for a long time, the women's game just didn't get that, didn't get the financial support and support it kind of deserved. So you would have kind of Harlequins ladies in Harlequins and Wasps ladies, but the, the, the clubs would never... Never meet, and now we like they've got some. They've got a professional league. They've got. Um, they did have. I think they've changed it now. But they did have contracted England players, uh, and they started to do a lot more stuff on social media. It's actually really kind of built some momentum, and um, you know it's really nice. Like we were interviewing someone yesterday for the RPA awards, and um, you know she'd won a players' player of the year award uh, yeah. for, for the England team. They've been absolutely carving up, and I said to her. You know, what were your role models when she was growing up? And she said, you know, I didn't really have any in this sport. Yeah. I used to play in Scarborough. I played with the boys till I was up till I was 15. They didn't let me and I had to drive an hour out of the way. Um, and basically, she, I said, well, you do know that you're now a role model. She goes, yeah, yeah I get little girls coming up to me and saying, That's amazing. you know, I, I want to play for England one day and stuff. So it, it's definitely developed. It, it's something that's, it's taken a bit of time because it was basically still amateur, even though they were playing for England. You know, they were meeting up for such a short period of time, no backing, no finances. And, and you'll see now that the stand is going up across the across the board. I mean, I I don't watch a lot of women's rugby. I hundred percent support it. You know, um, I actually um, like uh, I quite like women's cage fighting to yeah. boxing. I think, but I, I think women's rugby. I I think it's brilliant, I, and I hope that it keeps it keeps growing. And I think the stuff they're doing behind um, on social media and things is is it's, so, it's like creating personalities yeah. so people now know who these players are and what they're doing. And I, I hope that the men's side, England side, could do more with the women's. I think the club side, you know, when you go to Harlequins now, all their, all their posters and pictures on the wall. So it means that they're seen as, they're seen as the same importance, yeah. which I think is the right way to do it. No, I think I, I totally agree because oh, the internet's going a bit shit again. We back. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're we, back. Yeah, Sorry, back. you froze them. No, it's but... fine. I th- I totally agree because growing up, like women's rugby was just never really the case. But I think I've started following it more and more on social media, um, and kind of social media is an amazing thing for kind of making Hello? awareness. Oh, can you hear me? Right, we're back recording. Yeah, what I was saying about uh, women's rugby is that. Um, I've seen it more and more on social media and I think it's just really important how, cause it, it always surprised me how they do like the rugby world cup and then the rugby, the women's rugby world cup is like a month after. And I'm just like, why don't they just do it at the same time? Like. Yeah, it would be quite good actually. I mean, I, again, I, I don't know how to, you know, if they played after each other and stuff, I think, I think trying to merge and making stuff like that happen would be great. I mean, you know, there's a couple of times I played at uh, Twickenham and they've had, um, you know, had the women's women the women's team play afterwards. Yeah, um, which I think it's been really good. Um, and you know, even if get them to play before, but normally they they feel, they feel about chewing up the pitch um, beforehand. But I think it's, I think doing more and more stuff like that together would be great. Holding some joint training sessions would be great. Obviously, you know, non-contact stuff. But um, you know, I think it's I think it's really important. What's it like playing at Twickenham? Um, mate, it's amazing. Uh, you know, I. I you know, when I got to play there once when I was 15 at school, um, and it kind of was incredible, really. It um, it sort of, you know, the sight, smells and sounds of it really just captured my imagination from that early age. And there was something so special about it. And going to watch England play there so many times, it was just, it was fantastic. And I, I you know, when you run out there and, you know, it just feels like home. And, you, yeah. you know, the flame cannons go off and the 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 hairs in the back of your neck go up and you sit there singing the national anthem and 80,000 people are so- singing along with you. Um, and, it, and it's just, yeah, I just think everything about it, the feel, the, the size of it, you know, we train, we train sometimes in there when it's empty and it still feels so special. It still feels like it's, you know, your kind of, your patch. Um, and there's nothing like it. You know, I think probably every, every home nation probably has a similar sort of, a similar sort of feeling towards their stadium, but I think Twickenham is pretty unique. I know people, you know, agonisingly call it HQ, which is fucking horrible. It's Twickenham, um, it's Twickenham, but I, I, yeah, I just love it. No, that's cool, man. That's cool. So let's go back to the music side of things. When did um, when did when when was it when you're like, I want to be a DJ? So, you know, I said it, I said that I'd sort of notice people. Um, you know, I, I wanted to, to, to be the one in the room controlling people. I wanted that kind yeah. of to, to, to capture that. And I, and I wanted to play around the music. And I, I love technology as well. I'm a real tech head. So, 
you know, I, I've always fascinated by, by pioneers and DJ and I always watch people. And I bought myself a controller. Um, I remember kind of being in, in New Zealand uh, around, when was it? Sort of 2012. Yeah. 2012. And I was basically, um, one of my teammates had a Newmark something N7 mixer or uh, controller. It was one of the first controllers he was using Serato. And Serato gifted it to him. Uh, amazing um, guy called Morgan Donoghue who used to work for um, Serato was the MD of them in in, um, uh, in New Zealand, obviously where it's originated from. And, and now he works for in music. And he, I, I got put in touch with him and I basically asked, you know, could, could he put me up, get a discount? And I think he was thinking, who the fuck's this bloke? So I got a discount on a mini little Vestex controller and I started trying to play it and, you know, I thought I assumed I would be able to DJ, but obviously <laughs> I, I couldn't. I was like, you know, so I couldn't get it right, and I, I didn't understand. You know, I, I'm not one of these people that I have to learn in a linear fashion. I'm yeah. not particularly creative or artistic. I don't have, I didn't have that ear for it. Yeah. And I started playing around, and basically, it turns out that a lot of rugby, a lot of rugby fans are DJ. So I got a chance to to do something with Seb Fontaine. You know, yeah. he, he gave me a lesson on Tractor once, which was which was great in a club in uh, Clapham. I th- on, uh, place called Void, or not Void, I can't remember what it's called, but it was, it was an amazing um, sound system and stuff in there. And he gave me a quick lesson, which was great. And um, a lady called DJ Laura, who helped me. And Jaguar Skills, I got to know, and he was a fan. He, he He's, tried he's teach, amazing. Maybe he tried to teach me beat juggling and stuff. And I was like, fucking hell. So <laughs> I was doing, and, and then I was doing all these things. I just couldn't, I couldn't quite pick it up because I didn't understand the st- structure, music, phrasing, yeah. uh, you know, beat. I just didn't get, get what's going on, you know. And actually... Weirdly enough, um, do you know the, the hip hop DJ P Money? Yes. The P Money gave me a DJ lesson once in New Zealand on uh, while I was on a night out steaming, and he was trying to show me, and I'd be like, "Is that right?" He's like, "No," and I couldn't hear. You know, no. Obviously, now my ear is such that I can hear when anybody makes a mistake. Yeah, which yeah. fucks me off because I, I I make mistakes all the time. You can't just pretend you didn't hear it. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, and um, it, you know, you can hear something drift off and drift back and stuff. And it's amazing how many people don't notice at all. Like you'll ask people, did you notice that? Like, no. no. Or, or, you know, or you'll hear like some of the best DJs in the world, like Carl Cox, you know, he'll, 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 make, he'll slam something in or something isn't in. I know he used to wear, used to wear, he used tractor. So things were quite, uh, it was, it was sunk up anyway, so yeah. it didn't matter. But you see him mixing it, you hear people adjust it. I think it's quite nice, actually. It shows you're doing it real. If it drifts a little bit, it can add a different vibe. It shows um, you're human. Yes, yeah, exactly. Like, come on, yeah. it shows you're human, yeah. Exactly. And I, so I then, I then basically was like, look, I can't do this. And a teammate of mine um, got invited to a, a, on a, a sub bass course. Sub bass is, du- is yeah. dust now, but it's, it, um, you know, got, got, got paid to this, this, this DJ course. And he started doing it. And I was like, right, that's what I need to go and do. So I applied to their DJ course. And I was basically did a one on one lessons with this guy, John, uh, I can't think of his surname, for, you know, once a week for for three months, four months, whatever. Yeah. And uh, and uh, if you completed that course, you got to DJ at Ministry of Sound. Okay. Uh, so I did I did Ministry of Sound on the balcony. Um, uh, I don't know, was it like ten to eleven in the evening? My first DJ gig. Yeah. And uh, I just, I just, yeah, I, I was so much pressure. I, I my hands were shaking, and I just I just fell in love with it. And I was yeah. like, the intensity of it, the fun of playing the tunes, seeing people's reactions, and basically. That was probably seven years ago, um, and I called my um, my then agent up and I said, "Listen, I've got to get into DJing." And a guy, um, a guy called Guy from Coalition, um, he they put me in touch, and he obviously looks after like celebrity DJs and yeah. in Um And I was like, "Look, I want to DJ," and I started just getting on the uni circuit. And he was like, "Well, you know, why are you get into it? Because like, I love it and I just want to do it." And he goes, "Good, because you won't make any money." I was like, "All right." Um, and then I got paid loads of money to keep doing DJ gigs. And I was doing like all all the uni stuff. I mean, I, I headlined for 5,000 people, which was fucking That's insane. Amazing. At, the, um, at the Winter Garden, it was the Young Farmers. Young Farmers Conference, right? In Western which Super is, Mare? Yeah, yeah. Mate, right, that's not, like... Yeah, like, no, Brighton. It was in Brighton. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Right. So it was in Brighton, Young Farmers thing, right? And so I, t- my, I got asked to do it and I turned up and uh, I was with my wife and I said, um, the organizer, let me go and have a look at the setup. Right, so let me look, see, make sure the equipment because sometimes it's a bit lax. The ride, like, give you a pair of like CDJ 900s or like a <laughs> or, or just a 2000 without a Nexus. You're like, you can't, you can't, there's no loop. What the hell? Yeah. Um, and um, I basically walked out on this on this stage and there was a band on. So I said, Oh, who's on after these? They went, Oh, you are. I went, Okay, that's fine. So I could, you know, I'd have to worry about it. if I was following you, you know, I can't just turn up and play commercial house, I'd have to know what you were doing. Yeah, yeah. 
And then, uh, and then I, I said, well, who's on afterwards? They said, nobody. I said, well, is, what, you're headlining. And I was like, what, am I? And I just hadn't read the contract. And I was like, well, how many people are here? And it went 5,000. And I went, what, for, yeah, but not 5,000 here, probably 5,000 in Brighton for the conference. They went, no, no, it's 5,000. Took me out to show it and mate, there was a railing with 5,000 people in this fucking thing, like however many deep. And I got, and I was like, oh my God. And to be honest with you, my wife said she has never seen me in all the years smile more than, than, than I did. And I killed it. And I've got, I've got some video footage of it. I said, and it just went, it just went off. And, you know, people laugh, go, oh, you're playing. I'm like, but mate, it's 5,000 people. It was like, it was it's wicked. Um, and, and interesting enough, it, it met, the story made it into the Daily Mail uh, because the young farmers that weekend, obviously they hadn't been let off the farm for a while, went completely <laughs> insane trashed all of Brighton and even though I had nothing to do with it they were like you know oh, they you know causing pit carnage arrest something else and England rubber player James Haskell was DJing for them as if I'd done anything <laughs> wrong um so I couldn't escape scandal anyway but uh yeah and then I opened for Craig David last summer in Ibiza Ibiza Rocks um but yeah it's weird because I kind of and I've done I've done sort of five um uh sort of unique mix in collaboration with Defective we just work it was oh sorry four and I was working on volume five now just made my first track but my my musical tastes are very different than what I get could play because there's nothing worse than a DJ going this is what I play and turning up to a gig and just playing that head yeah. down and not worried about it so I turn up to to play something and I'm like I want to play this I want to play this side of it and I turn up uh, you know, you'll ease into a couple of songs C and then before you know it, you're like, for fuck's sake, play something super commercial because that's that's what they want. And yeah, and yeah. what I really appreciate is when, you know, like the house DJ or the resident DJ or people come up and go, fucking hell, you could, you could actually DJ. I'm like, yeah. You know, so I go back and see my my DJ teacher, um, Alex Grover. All, he's from a, a group called Because of Art or a two, some production two called Because yeah. of Art. He, he DJ to teach, teach at, um, at Sub Base and... Uh, but like we, well, you know, we need to do four deck mixing, three deck mixing, acapellas, all this kind of, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. Um, because I, I want to really keep up scaling, and I, I, I approach it the same way as I approach rugby. So, you know, I, I go and the tour them. Uh, Dev Stars just done a new course. I was like, fuck it, I'm going to do the course. I'll just yeah. see see what I can. Just even just pick up little nuances a bit, you know. No, I think I think it's amazing, man, because it's it's so nice to see your like passion in it, like that when you were talking about going in front of 5,000 people, I literally got goosebumps because <laughs> that feeling is... I don't think anyone can ever feel that in their life when... Like, for me, like, festivals and things like that, like, I've been lucky enough to play some amazing festivals and play in front of so many people. And Where's your highlights of festivals? Like, give me some ideas. Like, where, where have you, like, where's your top three? My favourite festival I've probably ever played... Mm. There's a festival called Crossed in San, San Diego, which is just, I don't know what it is. Um, it's just something about it, and it's just fucking amazing. And I, I played when I was like, it was like two years ago I played last time, and I was like second from headlining. And it was, yeah, so you're like second from the festival closing, really. Um and you literally just get out and you can't see the end of, of the of the crowd. And when you know that, obviously not that many people are there to see you, like probably none of them fucking know who I am. But it's, you just have to play like it's your last gig and you have to make sure that every record you play, they're going to respond to it. And everything that you do, it, it, you're doing it for a reason. And like... You know, when you like, I don't know if you ever, you've ever done it in, in gigs or when playing rugby or something like that, when you like, you know, you've done a really fucking good job and you like come off and you actually like walking down the corridor of the hotel back to your room and you're like, yeah, I fucking did a good job. Like, like Conor McGregor just doing all that. Literally like, by yourself in yeah. the mirror. <laughs> yeah. 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 But mate, that's, that's, that's what it's, that's, you know, why do something if you don't get that level of enjoyment out of it and, and, and fun out of it? And I think, you know, it is such unique thing to sit in front of the thing and uh, uh, sit in front and get and perform and everybody's like no it depends on it and just till you've done it and seen that you've gone i'm going to take i'm going to put this track or i thought i'm going to do this and watch everyone's dancing and then just watch the energy because you just haven't picked the right track and then you know they're, they're dancing like this and then they'll just you know they just pick they just pick up a phone like just start talking the shoulder's yeah, still yeah. going but then you're like shit how do i get back out of that how am i going to capture them you know 
Um, I th- and it's yeah. it's amazing. I think that's the thing that a lot of people forget about being a DJ. There, there's two types of DJs. There's DJs that are willing to play to the crowd and, and entertain a crowd. And there's DJs that people just go because they're just DJs, right? Yeah. And there's some DJs that it's like, I don't know, for example, off the top of my head, I can't think of any of who, but there's just some DJs that just, they're just playing that thing and you're just going there to see them play that thing. Um, and there's other DJs that kind of change things up and kind of play to the crowd, but also within within what what you play. Yeah, um, there's no point booking, you know, like it, it, I think it's difficult for me because I always check as well what music they want me to do because, you know, you can't, I, I just say this, I'm not doing hip hop, I'm not doing R&B, yeah, it's yeah. not my thing. I don't, you know, this is what I'm going to do. Well, can you do this? No, I can't. Yeah. I'll do it in the realms of what I want to do it in, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not an open format, do whatever you want to do. I, you know, I, I will make it as, as, as crowd friendly as possible. But I remember watching something with Laid Back Luke saying that, you know, he got invited to do a, you know, a, it was a techno club and he was playing, you know, and everyone was just like, so he just cleared the dance floor because he's trying to play EDM. And he was yeah. like, well, you know, if I'd known I would have played techno, but I didn't know. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, <clears throat> I think most promoters know, like, what you play, like, when you like, let's say for instance, you, you you start releasing records, and you kind of build a sound up for yourself. People, promoters will eventually know what kind of what they're going to get. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm really lucky where promoters book me to play Will Clark music, and they book me to and people pay tickets to see that, and it's, it still amazes me every day that they do that. But it's like when 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 people are coming to see you for the music that you play that's when you can kind of go in and you can be like okay i'm going to play them music that they've never heard and still control the dance floor and still be in a situation where you have control over the whole club and you want to purposely take them down and and make sure that they're not or, or make them kind of a little bit more chilled and and not as focused on the music, and then you can kind of hit them with with the stuff you want to hit them with. And yeah, but uh, you know, they like, said so, you know, once you've got them in the palm of your hand, and you've taken them where you want to go. You can then by the end of it, you'll be playing anything. They're yeah. still going to lo- love what you're doing. Yeah, man, it's that's, that's it's, kind of the sweet spot, I think, where you you know everything you're doing is is you know I, I once did I did um, four hours back to back with Carly at uh, Soho Farmhouse, and yeah. it's one of my most favourite gigs of all time. We basically, she, I walked past, I didn't know she was there. She said, "Go you come on, Hass. I said, I haven't got my music with me. I, 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 and she goes, well, you can use my music. I said, well, okay. And I said, well, I've got my laptop, actually. If someone gets me a spare USB, so I got a USB. And I was like, try, but obviously, you know, like, when you update to a USB for the first time, it takes, <laughs> takes took like three hours of the hour yeah. to fucking get anywhere. So it was driving me mad. But I started DJing and we basically, I said, what's the, what's the vibe? He said, it's just chilled, chilled house, right? And... So we're playing and we, you know, we just started slowly building up stuff. And, and there was probably about, I don't know, 200 people outside on sun lounges, people vibing. And then as we played some more and more slightly, slightly cooler tracks, a few, people started gravitating towards the dance floor. And the sun was shining, people were serving drinks and we just started building and building. And by the, by the third hour, you know, going into the last hour, we had, you know, I would say a good hundred people on their feet dancing yeah. around. And I was, you know, we were just going back to back, you know, one song, two songs, whatever it was, just vibing, 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 playing. And then the last hour, mate, we blew the doors off. We had everybody in that place on their feet. There was, I mixed um, an XTC um, song into something else. And it got quite a bit, got quite, quite, quite techy towards the end. And I almost cried. It was like a, such a long build up of a mix. Like the summer shine, mate, people were like hands in the air, so I get goosebumps talking about it. like hands going up in the air. You know, you're like echoing it, boom, bit, whatever it is, like a bit low pass, and then it drops. But everybody went mad. I even got by the last ten minutes, we end up playing just losing it. Uh, you know, losing it, and everybody's fucking throwing shit in the air. And and the the, the owners were like this. The managers, two of the managers, were like just keep going. So we went for like another half an hour. They were supposed to close everything. Mate, it was the greatest fun I've ever had. And it was and it was. I didn't get paid. Didn't do anything. Just spent four hours with a mate just seeing where we could go and yeah. seeing what we could do and who, who we could capture. And, uh, mate, but I sent you a couple of uh, videos at the end cause I still got them. There's me like just singing along with the words. Mate, it's so it. cool. Oh, fuck man. I miss it so much. <laughs> I, know, I, I know. miss it so much. <laughs> do you, do you seem to do, do you do a lot more stuff in America than the UK? Yeah. So, uh, for, I, 
from I signed to Dirty Bird Records years ago, um, and kind of obviously they they used to be bigger in Europe, um, but they've clawed. It, Who owns Dirty Bird? But Claude von Stroke. Well, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so the whole crew kind of became a lot bigger in America. So yeah, I ended up starting to get booked in America a lot more than I get booked here. In the last like the next well last year, um, and obviously the plan for this year was to kind of move things more into the UK and, and Europe. Um, but obviously Rona fucked us, but yeah, that's the plan eventually that we, I love America so much. Like it's my second home. I live there as well. So you live in the heart of, of, of house and techno in Detroit. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty, it's, it's strange because Detroit has this like, amazing musical history from like Motown. Like, I don't know if you know, but Motown yeah, started yeah. in Detroit. You had like some of the best music come out of Detroit and it's a very harsh, it's a very blue collar city. Um, And then you had like the crazy race riots that were just like, where pretty much the city got burned down. Um, In fact, the first place where I lived in Detroit, the, the, the roads were cobbled stone still and the, there was like potholes in, in the roads. And I was like, why, why are these roads like still like so bad? And they were like, this was the, these were the tank marks from when the race riots happened in the sixties. And I was like, Jesus Christ. Like it, that, that city is, I absolutely love it, but it's gone through so much shit that you like nowhere in the UK has, has gone through what Detroit has gone through. Um, and yeah, and then obviously techno is the is the birth of techno. So the the heritage of music in Detroit is unbelievable. The scene in Detroit now is not that not as good as what everyone thinks it is. Um, you've got the Paxahow guys. You've got the mean like Paxahow runs Movement, which is the best techno festival in the whole of the the America. Pretty much, it's, it is the the festival to go to if you if you like techno um and and that's run by a promoter group called pax how and they're amazing they do amazing things in the city you've also got uh mean red who they're from new york do a huge parties in new york but also move to detroit and kind of do things in detroit so detroit's still like this kind of evolving city where downtown eight years ago you wouldn't walk you'd be shot it, it's just it was not a nice place and you've had a lot of big investment in detroit from from big business that has made downtown an amazing cool little like quirky city and there's some amazing pockets in in, in detroit it just needs a bit more love um so yeah i moved there nearly three years ago um and just mostly tour in america but the plan is to come back here definitely and how, how much were you touring at your peak like what what we'd like every night or like yeah, so the most amount of shows I've done in a year is about 112. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I think last year we did about 85, 90. Um, That's so cool. I'd love to be doing that. Yeah, man. I'm so lucky. Like, I have the best fucking job in the world. Like, it's. I, well, you had the best job in the world. We had to retrain as a fisherman yeah, or a fireman. I've got to retrain. I'm going to be a baker, mate. So I'm going to do. If you're into cooking, I'd tell you what you should do. Genuinely, going back to our opening thing about, you know, you said you should wake up, train, eat, and then go, right, I'm going to do three hours in the studio, set yourself, then go and, like, put yourself lunch, cooking, baking, and then go, I'm going to come back for three hours, and then just bracket everything in hours instead of going, I'm just going to sit in the studio and sitting there all day until someone comes and visits you, just playing around, tinkering. You should structure it more, and I reckon you'd be way more productive. If you throw yourself into more into cooking and baking, end up probably be better at both by the time you finished yeah i there's a there's a hotel called porlock on the weir which is no it's, it's called lacanda which is in porlock in the on the weir which is uh yeah. Yeah, i don't know if you don't know if you've been down there but i i went so it's this like cute little hotel like country hotel and the food it's not they've not got a michelin star but it's practically michelin star food I got talking to the owner and he invited me down to like learn to cook with him for a week. So I went and stayed, stayed there for a week and kind of learned, did a load of cooking or literally spent 12 hours in the, in the restaurant or in the, in the kitchen for like seven days. And like, as much as I love cooking, that made me realize I don't ever want to be a fucking chef. No, no. That's what <laughs> a lot of people say. Yeah. It's, it's so like, I'm not afraid of working. 
but they do so much work and also not for that much money. Unless- That's why you should, you should um, you read uh, Kitchen Confidential, um, you know, or listen to Kitchen Confidential by, um, I can't remember which uh, favourite chef it is, um, because it's, it's amazing about how he's actually killed himself. Andy um, Bourdain. Oh, you know, Anthony uh, Bourdain, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's why they're all alcoholics, drug takers, yeah. fornicators, everything else, because they, it's so stressful and they're like, you know, they're such artists, they're creative. You have to be a little bit mad to do it. And, you know, unless you make it big time, you don't earn the cash and it's fucking, yeah, crazy, crazy life. It is crazy. But then again, it, it's, it's the same as, same as what we were talking about is that you have to work so hard to get to where you want to get to. And yeah. unless you're going to work that hard you're, you're going to be shit it's the same in rugby same in music same in everything you we all see the the top of the sh- the top of the range chefs we all go to their restaurants we're all like oh we really want that restaurant i wish i could have that but are you willing to put the fucking work in yeah probably not no exactly probably. i've um well i've got a um a call in five minutes yeah let's bounce company. it off no problem. Is that, sorry, I would. I talked to you for hours, but I just, I've just got a notification that just popped up. No, it's fine, man. Dude, thank you very much for being on the show. Before we go, how can people get the book, read the book, listen to it, follow your podcast, do all of that? Plug so, yourself. Um, yeah, so I've got a few things. I apologize for all the, uh, the sort of, you know, promote it, promotion. But uh, if you hit, hit me up on Instagram at James Haskell, you can find my book, Water Flanker. Um, it's available uh, in all good bookshops uh, on Amazon. Got an audio book on Audible and Apple. Uh, if you like um, your house music, um, and hopefully following Will, you do, you can find my uh, radio show, which is uh, Back Row Radio um, on uh, Apple and Mixcloud. Um, yes, yeah, Mal, we get about 200,000 listeners per episode. Um, and I don't know why people like it so much. I think because I keep playing Will Clark's shoes. Is basically <laughs> what, what, you know, he's your new, ch- new track church is going to be in this, this month. So I'm going to record later after this next call. Cheers, man. Big love. Um, let's keep in touch and see you soon. Perfect. Cheers, pal. Cheers, and yeah, keep, keep keep any tunes. I tell you what, um, we should maybe. I mean, I'm, I tell you what, I really struggle is is um, is with vocals and stuff like that for for tracks and everything else. Like that we should maybe when I get this next one done, I'll send it to you. See what you think. Maybe we should make a track together one day. Mate, I'm always, I'm I'm actually hiring a studio in London on quite a regular basis. So if you want to come down for the day, Mate, I would welcome. love that. I'm perfect. I just come in the morning and just sit there all day. Cause it, you know, I mean, by the end of the day, you'd have, have an idea of where you we'll want to have something. Where you want to take it. Yeah, definitely. We'll make some tech tech house. I, I mean, the problem is my first one's so commercial. Then the next one is, is slightly more, you know, cause it, it, when I started making it, it was like Pac or Asuna vibes. Yeah. It was like, I was like, well, the problem is I can't release one here and release one here because it makes no fucking sense. So what I'm going to try to do is gradually do so. Maybe do one with you, which is a bit more, even more edgy. I know you got two minutes, but I agree with you, but I also disagree with you. And I have this battle in my head every fucking day. And I think nowadays you can get away with just releasing what the fuck you want. Fine. Well, let's do it. I, I, think... I would just, if you next time you go to London, please just WhatsApp me. I'll give you my... Um, my details you got my uh, email haven't you as well yeah that yeah way. just that just drop me just drop me a whatsapp and we can right. definitely I would, I would love to is that the number you the number you text me or, yeah 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 i'll yeah. be the dream i'd love to I'll just see what we can come up with in a day absolute vibes let's do it mate let's do it All right cheers, keep pal. safe see you soon take care bye and that is a wrap i hope you enjoyed it that was uh that was a good one really really enjoyed that conversation we could have spoken for hours Uh, Thanks to everybody that's listened. Big ups to James for coming on the show. If you do like the show, please share it and tell everyone about it. Keep safe. See you next time.